with Game of Thrones Season 7 behind us. Let us quickly talk about the downfall of Littlefinger in the books as it relates to the ghost of Highheart's prophetic vision about a maid slaying a giant, a dream of a wolf howling in the rain, but no one can hear his grief. A dream of such a clamor, I thought my head would burst. Drums and horns and pipes and screams. But the saddest thing was the little bells. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. And later, I dreamt that maid again, slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. All three of these events were sparked by Rob's and Sansa Stark presence, respectively. I dreamt of a wolf howling in the rain, but no one can hear his grief. Refers to the Red Wedding, which was a trap meant for Rob. And it's the model to better understand the prophecy. I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, venom dripping from their fangs. Covers Sansa's unwilling involvement in Joffrey's assassination by killing the strangler, the signs as amethyst adorning her silver hairnet. And finally, I dreamt that maid again slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. Alludes to Sansa bringing down Peter Bayless, whose father's sigil was a stone giant or titan, most likely for the murder of Lysa Arryn, which she inadvertently precipitated by her presence in the Eyrie. Littlefinger's infatuation with Sansa starts to overcome him when he finds her in the Eyrie's would-be godswood, building a snow castle of Winterfell. May I come into your castle, my lady? After helping Sansa with her snow castle, Peter's romantic and sexual feelings overwhelm him as she looks so much like his teenage trust, Catelyn, and kisses her. Sansa squirmed and yielded for half a heartbeat before wrenching free and exclaiming, what are you doing? And Littlefinger responds, kissing a snow maid. That's what Liza's jealous eyes saw, sown the seeds of the Lord of Heaven Hall's downfall. As her emotional confrontation led to her defenestration. For Littlefinger, Sansa was an integral part in his plan as she is his key to the north. As she was for the Lannisters before him. For Bloodraven, she takes a much bigger role in the resurgence of the first man. But in the near term, the maid will outplay the Lord Protector since she has been positioned to learn the game from him and Cersei. With Peter Baelish ousting, the Rorses will join their distant kin the Starks in their war and will bring the rest of the Vale along with them. But more on that in the full version of the Vale video. It is intriguing that this is not the first time that Bataille's plan has been subverted by Brendan or a variant of that name. The first being Brandon Stark. Ned Stark's brother, who nearly mortally wounded Baelish in a duel for Catelyn's hand. The second being Brynden Rivers, who perturbed Bataille's entire plan, mortally wounding it. But this is not to say that the way is not fraught with danger for Sansa. After becoming mostly charged in the would-be godswood, Baelish exhibited similar behaviors as Meridian, the night of Liza and Bataille's wedding, where inebriated Meridian made unwanted advances on Sansa and he was only impeded by the timely intervention of Lord of Brune. But this time, Robin Aaron, Lord of the Vale, rescues Sansa from Peter's advances. When in the books, he interrupts the two by emerging into the garden to play with the snow castle and proceeded to destroy it with his doll. Enraging Sansa to inadvertently grab the head of Robert's doll as he swung, tearing it in two, sprawling the young lord into a seizure. Coincidentally, Sansa slaying the Lord of the Vale's doll is a popular explanation to the last third of the prophecy, but the theory overly focused on the signifier, meant to highlight the preceding scene, and not enough on the rest of Sansa's chapter. For another important passage foreshadows his demise, beginning with Lysa appearing and disappearing from her balcony, overlooking the would-be God's wood, as Sansa struggles building snow bridges, spanning the armory in the main keep and another between the bell tower and the rookery. But no matter how careful she shaped them, they would not hold together. After she cursed in frustration, Baelish emerges from the shadow to speak with her for the first time in the chapter, and advising her to pack the snow around a stick that would give it strength enough to stand. Continuing on this metaphor, the sticks serve as a brace or a linchpin, binding two parties together. And if we run the selected passage backward, we get the sequence that led to Lysa's defenestration. Beginning with the steady state of Lysa's and Peter's marriage, 
Their bread starts to crumble from Sansa's outburst, leading to Master Coleman's parents representing the rookery. As he attempts to soothe the seizing young Lord of the Vale, Liza's bell, or her object of admiration. And finishing on Sansa's summons to the Great Hall, which probably represents the main keep, since all of the Eerie's towers surrounds the center garden, and it's its most significant tower. Once inside, she sees Lysa sitting on the Willwood throne, with the Aaron's heraldic banner, falcon and moon, in cream and blue, behind her. Together, the two symbolizes the absolute authority of the Vale, which Lysa wields through her son. Lysa proceeds to falsely accuse Sansa of seducing Peter, and attempts to throw her through the moon door. She is only stopped by Peter's soothing words when he enters. Next, he persuades her to unhand Sansa, which she does. Afterward, Peter maintains that he only loved one woman, her sister, Catelyn, then shoves her through the moon door, and she disappears. While it still takes some time, but the bridge that spanned the veil under Littlefinger's thumb will crumble. Now let us change gears and focus on Littlefinger's downfall depicted in the show. It is arguably one of the weaker storylines in Season 7, but I believe it is due to the storyline doing too much as it paves the way for United North and other Season 8 storylines. The showrunners used the expected fiction between the Stark sisters after their reunion, coming from their different journeys, as a vehicle to deliver the bullet points of Bayless's fall. First, Littlefinger overplays his hand. Second, Sansa politically outflanks Peter, fracturing his insurgency. Third, Arya executes Littlefinger, which I will cover in the full version of the Veil vale video. With Littlefinger out of the picture, it leaves a member of House Royce to assume the regency of the Vale, which in the show, it's Young Royce, since he is the only other Vale Lord in the last two seasons with a speaking role, and is rather late in the series to introduce a new character, so it's better to row the role into an existing character. In that way, we still get the net effect. In the books, I project Nesta Royce to assume the role of Lord Regent over the Vale of Erin and to foster improved ties between the Starks and the Vale, in preparation of the Great War to come. A marriage will be arranged between the Aarons and the cadet branch of House Wars, who possibly has marriage ties to both the Starks and the Aarons. Additionally, a union between Miranda Wars, Nestor Wars' daughter, and Robert Aaron, Lord of the Vale, would install a friendly party to lead the region through this tumultuous time, and secure the Knights of the Vale to King Aemon's cause. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and those topics I will cover in other videos. Let us return to Season 7 of Game of Thrones and its storytelling as it moves further and further away off book. The series employs an interesting bit of storytelling, presumably to prevent many book spoilers, in that I believe Dan and Dave jumbled the given storyline of Song of Ice and Fire from George R. R. Martin, if not admitted altogether, like the Dornish and religious storylines, for example. And what I mean by jumble is the reamalgamation of the story incorporating several changes including rolling several characters into one, changing their names, titles, motives, events, and how they follow one another. It retains its principal themes while adding spectacle to keep the audience engaged, such as the wild goose chase to find evidence to convince Cersei, perhaps fruitlessly, to join the rest of Westeros against the Night King and his minions or the revelation of Jon Snow's two parentage late in Season 7, subtly implying between Daenerys and Jon he is the main protagonist in the series. But the game should have been up once he was resurrected, in my view the Force Lightbringer. Season 7 juggles several story arcs, including Jon and Danny's meeting, the Starks reuniting, Danny and Cersei's military strength waning after Daenerys' initial invasion, and the North consolidating, among others. So there's a great deal to cover in seven episodes, and because of it, we the audience see a lot of compression. Characters jumping here and there, competing various deeds in an hour-long episode or more, as the song marches to its crescendo. Which is understandable, but we lose a bit of the scale of Planetos in the process, and at times it feels like a summary of events. The problem seems to stem from the show spending too much time on its action set pieces, especially in the last two seasons. I guess it's a side effect of having one big episode each season, or producing television at this time. Rest assured they are great episodes, but the showrunners employed different tools than the books to achieve similar results. 
for what the HBO series does well, it plays with the audience expectations and can sell in clues in the series Endgame. Let us take a look at the central characters of Riviera's story from season 4 to 7, since season 4 begins to vet from the books significantly, beginning with John standing before a council for his actions. Sir Alistair Thorne and Jaina Slint accuse John of being a turncoat and an oathbreaker, and the season ends with John poised to kill Manch Raider during a parlay, but interrupted when Stannis' army falls on the Wyoming camp. Next season, John turns down Stannis' enticing author to name him Lord of Winterfell, but was later elected as the 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch by his sworn brothers. However, a mutiny cut his reign short after he made several unpopular decisions, including allowing the Wildlings through the wall. In hindsight, John's move to allow the Wildlings south of the wall was the opening step to unite all the First Men under one banner. In Season 6, John returns back to his body and continues his upward trajectory. Later, John reunites with Sansa, and the Starks reacquire the North after the Boltons are eradicated, like the Greenwoods long ago. Season 6 ends with John proclaimed King in the North. The next season begins with the last one left off, John and his council preparing for the Great War. Meanwhile, the show's hints on the series end steadily increases, besides the ones about John being the heir of the Iron Throne. For the show borrows a similar technique employed in the books, concealing hints within larger events. In the case I'm about to go over, the HBO series sets a metaphorical bonfire against the night sky to distract the viewers from anything happening in the background. In Season 7, the showrunners can drive a storyline that features John's expedition north of the Wall as one of the two major action set pieces. It basically recycles an earlier storyline from the books, where Geo Mormont, then Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, sent Sir Alistair Thorne with the silver hand of a white to proceed King's Landing for fresh levies, and it's given the George R. R. Martin treatment, combining one story to another and turning it up to eleven. But what John's excursion north of the wall to catch a white does, it provides a platform to tell another story, or to be more precise, two stories told at the same time, and in this case with some alterations to make it fit. And the two stories are from Jon Snow's legendary lineage, the last hero, and the Zohar High, the prince that was promised forging Lightbringer. The tale of the last hero is the story of seeking allies and merging their strength onto yours when I presume the individual who will be later known to history as Brandon the Builder, the founder of House Stark and the Lion of the Kings of Winter, build a grand alliance between the Children of the Forest and the First Men of the newly formed Night's Watch. After setting out to seek the children for aid, with how old Nan puts it, with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched until he despaired of ever finding the Children of the Forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally, even his dog. And his sword frozen so hard, the braid snapped when he tried to use it. Although the tale abruptly ends, it's alluded that he was only saved by the timely intervention of the Children of the Forest. Since the previous chapter, Bran was recalled back to his body by the aid of the Three-Eyed Crow. Furthermore, we know the others were defeated and pushed back to the lands of always winter. As an aside, it is interesting that a descendant of Brandon, the Bloody Blade, who warred with the giants and the children of the forest, was selected to be the champion. It's like one of Abraham Lincoln's quotes, Am I not destroying my enemy when I make them my friend? Especially when one adds, sometime after the pact, the first men put aside the gods they took with them and took up worship of the secret gods of the woods. Now the story's parallels in the episode. John heads up north to seek additional allies, but in this occasion, southern allies since the children of the forest are seemingly killed off. However, the results of this venture are mixed, and is tied to the other half of the story. Another parallel in the episode is the number of men accompanying John from beginning in his incursion up north. And I would also argue that other story elements are there too, with some alterations, say the horses which are probably reserved for only large battles between two armies. The sword that shatters in the story is replaced by the Valerian Longclaw, but the force accompanying John does shatter again, like it did in Hart Home. Additionally, the Hound is replaced by Sander Clegane, who plays a dual role 
as Sansa's hound and one of John's companions. As a quick aside, I believe Sansa's story of losing the Direwood but later gaining the hound and essentially gaining another guardian after losing the original, possibly alluding to the end of the last hero's story where he attains a Direwood after he loses his hound during the quest because there has to be a backstory for them to take a direwolf as their sigil. It's unlikely that they domesticated the animal through normal means, since the Green Seers employed them, among other creatures, against the First Men in the war before the pact. So it's more likely that the direwolves was a gift from the Children of the Forest, a gift that they put on their banners, displaying their favor with the old gods of the Children of the Forest. Now let us go over the last point of comparison between the tale and the episode. The miraculous intervention that evidently occurred, but not explicitly spelled out, or at least not yet in the books, since the last hero successfully reached the Children of the Forest and made a grand alliance between the first men of the Night's Watch and the Children. In the episode, the miraculous intervention took form of Benjamin's rescue of John after he got separated and surrounded. Benjamin plays a cold hand like character, although it's improbable he's that character in the books but I believe it is done to have the rescue carried out by someone representing the children while playing on the audience's heartstrings. As another aside, in the books, the character of Conehan subtly sees the idea of a Willwood White who possibly possesses free will, as does Beric Dondarrion, after his several deaths, introduces the idea of a Fire White who lost all of his memories since his first resurrection. Since both men are brought back by various gods, it is also inferred that these gods have similar abilities. In the case of Cold Hands, he was recalled to aid the execution of the old gods, Children of the Forest's plan. For he escorted Sam and Gilly to the wall and guided Bran and company to the Three-Eyed Crow while killing five Night's Watchmen involved in the mutiny at Crastus Keep. Similarly, Beric Dondarrion was brought back by a servant of Valor for its ends. Now, one must note this is markedly different than when the Three-Eyed Crow intervened in the near-death experience of Jojen, Bran, and John. Without further ado, let us transition to the other half of the story, Azor Ahai, Forging Lightbringer. The story of Lightbringer is a story of dedicating oneself to a single cause. The ancient prophecy begins after a long summer when the star bleeds and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. And that dread hour a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword. And that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes. And he who claps it is a Zora High come again, and darkness shall flee before him. Basically saying, the one who wields Lightbringer shall be a Zora High, and he will bring back the dawn. And the legend of the forging of Lightbringer states, In a time when darkness lays heavy on the world, to oppose it, the hero must have a hero's blade, oh, like none has ever been before. And so for thirty days and nights, Azora High labored sleeplessly in the temple, forging the blade in the sacred flames. Heat, hammer, and fold. Heat, hammer, and fold. Oh, yes, until the blade was done. Yet when he plunged it into water, to temper the steel, it burst asunder. Being a hero, he remained undeterred. The second time, it took him fifty days and fifty nights, and this blade seemed finer than the first. Azor High captured a lion to temper the blade by plunging it into the beast's red heart, but once again the steel shattered and split. Great was his woe, and great was his sorrow then, for he knew what he must do, and for a hundred days and for a hundred nights he labored on the third blade, and as it glowed white-hot in the sacred flame, he summoned his wife, Nisa, Nisa. He said to her, Bear your breasts, and know that I love you best of all that is in this world, and plunged the smoldering blade through her living heart. It is said that her cries of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon, but the blood in her soul, in her strength, in her courage all went into the steel. So the overall theme of the passage is of sacrifice, in that the metal urgy likely took place in the Reloian temple since it is their tale, and Azor Ahai made two blood sacrifices, a lion, which could be a metaphor for a rival monarch, and the love of his life. Additionally, the final phase of the metal urgy emphasizes the warrior of light shall not have his loyalties divided. Consequently, the blade was only consummated after he wed himself to his duty, and that duty 
is to end the White Walker threat. To quell it, a force or army is required. The HBO series sought to illustrate the forging through John's struggle to rally the realms against the others, along with several engagements with the Night's King. The engagements being the battle at Hartholm, the White Hunt north of the Wall, and the final battle for the Dawn in Season 8. The Battle of Hartholm depicts a skirmish between the Night's Watch and the others, where the Night's Watch in its debilitated state is the stand-in for Azor Hyde's First Blade, a basic trained army. Although it was the Lightbringer force in Westeros during the long night after the Age of Heroes. From this experience, John learns that he would need more than the whole of the North to counter the Army of the Dead. John's second encounter with the Night's King comes in his attempt to convince the other realms of the menace north of the Wall, the White Hunt. At the Wall, he assembles an all-star troop of veterans and several fearful guides to stand in for Azor Hyde's second blade, a battle-hardened army. However, the blade channels once more against the Great Other's legions, but this time due to pride. In the episode, this primarily takes form of a misstep revealing to the enemy that the lake which previously shielded the beleaguered troop has frozen over. The company was almost annihilated as a result. They were fortunate rescue came in the nick of time, but it exacted a heavy toll. From this engagement, the two branches of House Targaryen reconciled themselves to bear the might of Restros against their true adversary. But first, in the HBO series, John and Danny attempts to convince Cersei that the others are real and are the greater threat. But in the end, they leave the summit with an empty promise from Cersei, committing Lannister levies to aid in the War for the Dawn, which will probably have disastrous results in the upcoming battle. This concludes all the effects of this second attempt, sending the stage for Season 8 to continue its particular storyline, in respect what I strongly suspect will transpire in the books, where John will learn the truth of his parentage but will have to steer himself for the battle for the dawn. Eventually, the forces of the crown will snare and shatter the Night's King's hopes, giving way to the human conflict to continue. Presently, the Westerosi Civil War as it approaches its bloody resolution, a storyline meant to cover the book's plot in broad strokes, while concealing and hinting at other aspects, like the identity of Lightbringer being the National Army of Westeros, an army capable of defeating the Night's King and its legions drawn from the consecration of civil war, personified in the Targaryen sword, Blackfire. As a side note, this is perhaps why we will see the Golden Company in the last season of the show, since the last person on Westeros who possessed the blade formed that mercenary company. The sword Blackfire represents the imaginated strength of all of Westeros, this time under the determined leadership of Ice and Fire governing the enhanced conventional strength of the First Men and the Andals. Building from the previous Lightbringer's merger of strength from the Children of the Forest and the First Men, the Children were not blessed with great numbers, but their wise men were gifted in the sight. It turned out to be instrumental in the other's defeat, for the Children can learn of events far and away, and those yet to come. Unlike the Children, the First Men were blessed with great numbers and a different perspective of time where the children laments their eventual passing from this world. Men would not. They would imitate the violently flickering flame as the winter winds attempts to stifle it. Man would be wroth. They would hate and swear a bloody vengeance. Borrowing a few lines from one of Dylan Thomas's famous poems, men would not go gently into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. <laughs>